morning, Shades. Uh, it is so good to be with you all uh, this morning. Just standing here in front of you all, with you all, just makes me feel humbled and grateful for you, even if we don't know each other personally, just for who you are as this church. I mean, this, this church is very near and dear and special to me and my family. This is where uh, my first born son was dedicated and speaking of my family, got a little updated uh, picture of them right there. So it's Allie and our, our three kids. So, um, but this is also the church where you all had the, the crazy idea to allow me to become a pastor. I became a pastor here. And this is the church that God manifested his call on me and my wife's lives to church planting. And so Shades was the battleship that our fighter jet flew off of when we went to plant Antioch in downtown Birmingham, focused on UAB and the surrounding community. So I just, I just wanna say up front how much I love you, how much our church loves you and respects you and is thankful for you. And I also just wanna say that you all are very lucky to have the pastor and the staff and the deacons that you have. All of those people are the real deal. So you're very lucky and blessed to have them as your leaders. Um, and church planting, you know, it's, it's an adventure. And I, I use that word, you know, specifically. It's an adventure. I mean, there's an adventure has really high highs. I mean, you know, 360 panoramic views of the mountains. When you're up on that mountaintop, like when you're baptizing a student from Taiwan who just shared their story and said that the first thing they said was, I grew up in a Buddhist home and I'd never heard of Jesus, but now I know him and I love him and I follow him. Or like last week when a, a student shares with my wife that after having grown up in the church, but not really actually knowing Jesus and just kind of walking away and through kind of hitting a, a rough spot in her life, coming back to church and getting invited by a friend, she says that this is the first time, being a part of this church family is the first time I've ever felt love. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's why I get into this, so that God can do those kinds of things. That's obviously not me or anyone in our church, that's just God doing what he wants to do. But there's also really low lows. Because for any adventure to be an adventure, there's gotta be some risk involved. There's gotta be some danger. There's gotta be some fear. Otherwise, it would just be a walk in the park, which sometimes, honestly, would be nice. I think for all of us, it's not just church, but it's just life. It's an adventure. And there's danger at times. And uh, there was a, a young man who had started coming to our church, and he was just in a rough spot in life, and a couple of us um, had planned to get coffee with him just to help him work through some things, um, just struggling with just a lot of stuff in his life. And so we met up at the coffee shop, me and the, these other two leaders, a few minutes go by, and he doesn't show up, and so we give it another few minutes, and we call him, doesn't pick up, and we could never get a hold of him, and we waited about 30 minutes, and then we're like, I mean, we just... It was my daughter's birthday, like I, near the end of the day, like I, you know, I gotta get going, this, we can't start this meeting 45 minutes late. And so uh, the other two left, and I was the last one to leave the coffee shop a few minutes later, and then he uh, arrived. And so I went over to him and said, hey man, I'm you know, so sorry, like, he was like, you know, I was just late, I, he was riding the bus and he just he got behind, and I was like, man, don't worry about it, it's not a problem. And, um, we'll just find another time to meet up. And he seemed okay with that. And as I got to my car, started to hear him yelling um, and cursing. And you know, again, he's just, he was in a really difficult spot in life. So he wasn't you know, responding rationally to this situation. So I get in the car and before I can get home, I'm getting texts and calls from him and so is the other two leaders. And those texts and calls were not nice texts. They were very angry. Um, not rational, threatening texts that continued all night, and they stopped about the time I was gonna go to bed, and so I was like, all right, well, we'll figure out how to deal with this tomorrow, I guess. So I woke up, and no new texts, and I was like, okay, I guess this is over, and maybe he's kind of past this. So I get in the car, drive to my office, sit down at my desk, 
and almost as soon as I sit down at my desk, I get a text from him. And, and now he's not just saying things towards me, now he's talking about my wife. Now he's talking about my kids. And now I'm not just confused and like bothered and annoyed by this situation, now I'm angry. And then he sends a text that says this. He says, I'm coming over to kill you. I knew that he knew where I officed. I knew that he knew where I lived. My wife and kids were at the house. And I did not take time to say, okay, thanks for the heads up. Are you planning to come to my house or to my office so I can be prepared? No, I just, my, just adrenaline started flooding through my body. I ran to my car. I called 911 and I called Allie and said, lock the doors, don't go outside. I got home. Well, as I was driving home, I was just in this like time warp of like this fear of I'm going to get home but just be a few minutes too late. That I'll get there and sure enough, this wasn't just some empty threat but he was actually gonna act on this and I got there too late. It was, it was honestly one of the most terrifying 12 minutes of my life. I got home and within just a couple seconds the police arrived and thankfully this guy never came. He never showed up to the house. I couldn't sleep that night. I couldn't sleep for the next couple nights. And for the next couple of months, you know, I lived in that car ride home. That traumatic imprint that it had on me of like, man, if, if, if it, I could have just been a minute too late. Thankfully, you know, most of us aren't dealing with death threats on a day-to-day -day basis. But we are dealing with fear, with danger, and not just physical danger. For the most part, the danger that we're facing, and as we'll get to in Psalm 27, the fear that we're facing is actually not just events happening or natural disasters, but it's actually the fear of other people. And not just what they can do to you physically, but what they can do to you relationally, emotionally, I don't know, financially. Physically, yeah, but that's kind of at the top of the fear pyramid, is fear of man and what they can do to us. Now, it's, you know, it's the last thing that we wanted to do, but we had to, we had to lovingly tell this guy, man, we just, we love you and forgive you for you know, what you've said to us, but we're just, we're gonna have to connect you with a different local church. You just, it's not, we can't take that risk here at our church. And it's the last thing I you know, ever thought I would have to say to someone, or to this guy in particular, but the fear of man. I want us to look at Psalm 27. We're gonna start in verse one. And we're gonna hear David saying something pretty surprising. He says this in Psalm 27, verse one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When I read that, I'm like, I don't know, just the person who said they were gonna kill me? How is David saying this? How's he in this mindset where it's like, I don't have to fear anybody? I mean, it's so almost arrogant. In verse two, I mean, he's, this, he's got real danger. He says this in verse two and verse three, verse two. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh. So he's, he's got a physical danger. Most likely, this psalm, we're not, we can't know for, sh for certain, but it's, it's most likely that David wrote this psalm not while he was king, because if he was king, they're like, well, yeah, I guess I could understand. He wouldn't be all that afraid. I mean, he's got secret service. He's got, he's got backup. But most likely, he's not king. 
here. Most likely, Saul is king. And there are a number of other psalms that we know specifically are written in this time frame where Saul sent David a text and said, I'm coming over to kill you because he hated David because he was jealous and envious of him because the people of Israel loved David and they didn't really care for Saul. And that bothered him so much that he was the king and people weren't just bowing down and worshiping him and, and loving him. They, they liked David more. And so he wanted him dead and he, took, and he was taking matters into his own hands. So yeah, evildoers, they're assailing me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes. It's, but when, it, when they do, it's they who stumble and fall. I mean, just this confidence. Verse three, though an army encamp against me, which could have happened, my heart shall not fear. There was something in David that would say, there is potential danger. Like that's, what, that's what fear is. It's your body, your mind, your spirit's response to potential danger. Again, whether it's physical, emotional, relational, financial, spiritual, whatever it might be, but there's danger looming. And so your, your body and your mind responds to that. And yet he's saying, I see all this, and yet my heart shall not fear. Yeah, thank you, eyes, for telling me this, give me this raw data that there's a, a really powerful king coming after me who wants to kill me, and then his brain is interpreting that, and there's this little thing in your brain called the amygdala, which, among other things, is sometimes referred to as the fear center. It's the part of your brain that when your eyes or when your, your senses give this raw data of, like if you're walking across the street and you see a car flying at you, your amygdala goes, thank you, eyes, for letting me see that. Thank you, ears, for letting me hear this car coming. I'm gonna send some adrenaline rushing through your body so that you can get out of here, so you can get to the other side of the road and not get hit by this car. And somehow, David isn't responding that way. He's seeing the danger, and yet he's saying, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, though the, the whole armies, thousands of people could come fighting after just me alone, yet I will be confident. How? I mean, like, I want that. I want that. Not just in the face of physical harm. I mean, honestly, think about, like, what, of whom shall I be afraid, or as other Psalms put it, what can man do to me? It's like, they can do a lot. I mean, who, who in here can't remember something harmful said to you years ago? Right, the Bible says that in the power of the tongue is life and death. That people can kill you, kill your spirit with their words. Other people have a lot of power. You may not want to admit it, but they, but they do. And even in spite of that, Yet will I be confident. There's a guy uh, named Alex Honnold who has become famous in the last couple of years for his rock climbing abilities. So he's this world-renowned rock climber who has gotten famous most recently because he climbed uh, this 7,500-foot sheer rock face in Yosemite Valley. This rock face called El Capitan. And many other people have climbed this and they didn't become famous. And many people have, I say many, a few people have climbed the, the route that he did called Free Rider, which is a very difficult technical route, but they didn't become famous. So why did he? Because Alex Honnold was the first person to ever climb this route and the last, no one else has done it since, without a rope, completely exposed. Look at this photo of him climbing. <laughs> like, that's real. There is a documentary about this. I think it's called Free Solo. That's what this style of climbing is, where you do what normal people do and have ropes <laughs> and harnesses. And then I, this next photo is when he's doing a different Free Solo 
That's your amygdala right there. <laughs> Seriously, that, like, I, I look at that, and I'm like, you, like, my, my palms are getting sweaty. Because your brain's having this response of, like, he should not be up there. He's going to get hurt. He's going to die. Now, thankfully, this amazing uh, athlete has, has survived all of these climbs, and he's still alive to this day. And uh, unlike a lot of his peers, a lot of, a lot of people have died doing this. But, and so what, what scientists have done is they've gotten curious about this guy. Like, how does his brain work? Because none of, none of, no other person alive has done what he's done. He's like this fearless guy. He's kind, he kind of feels like David a little bit, where it's just like, there's this dissonance of like, you should be afraid. And he's not. And so they've done some scans on his brain, and they saw that his amygdala was a little bit smaller than normal, which is not that uncommon, apparently. And so, but they did further scans and tests. So they're like showing him these dangerous, distressing, frightful images and videos. And, and normally, a normal person's amygdala would be lighting up in the scan. And his just like, just like nothing. I mean, just like, it's like it's not even there. They cannot get this thing to react and to do anything. And so it's like, is he just like a superhuman? Or like, you know, like David, like, is, what's going, like how, how do you get to this point where you just, you don't have fear? And Alex has said in a lot of interviews, he's like, I'm not fearless. I, I was deathly afraid of free soloing for years. And he says, I'm still afraid to make a phone call to someone. It's not that he like physically can't fear, but it's almost like he kind of did like almost exposure therapy in a way, which is like where he, he would climb, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 feet without a rope, come back down. And he did it. And he got a little bit stronger, he got a little bit more confident. And he kind of learned to rock a little bit more, learned his, his body a little bit more. And then he goes a little bit higher, and then a little bit higher. And so he's facing this fear of falling off of a cliff voluntarily <laughs> and to his death. And he gets to this point where he's worked that exposure so much to where he's actually not afraid. He's able to, because if he was afraid and thinking about falling, he'd probably fall, but he's not thinking about that. He's thinking about where his hands are going. He's thinking about the next move for his feet. So I think the, the question that that makes me ask and that I believe this psalm is answering is how do you cure fear of man? What do you need to be exposed to? I mean, is it just you need to like take, you know, get a million counseling appointments and bring every person in your life that could potentially some, say something harmful or who has hurt you that you has given you reason to be bitter that, and just sit down and have some kind of, I don't know, like exposure therapy with them and then just do the next person. I mean, there's always gonna be somebody else. There's always gonna be something unpredictable that someone could do or say to harm you. To harm you in a way that you feel its impact for years to come. Verse four, I think, is the linchpin for this verse, and it's very, very insightful and interesting to me. And I think if we, myself included, can see what God is trying to say in verse four, I, I think it can literally change your life. Verse four, David says this, one thing have I asked of the Lord, Think about it. If you didn't fear anybody or anything, what would you need? Well, like, he's got everything. One thing that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What 
What's David saying? He's saying this. He, he's pulling back the curtain on, you want to know how I've gotten so fearless and confident? Daily encounters with God. Daily encounters with the presence of God. Continue. He says, you know, I want to I wanna dwell in your house. I want to be in your temple. He's not saying, like, I literally just want to go to church every single day, 24 hours a day. But what he's saying is, I want to go to church every single day, every hour of the day. I, wanna, I want to know that you're here. I want to know that you're with me and that you're for me and not against me. So, because what we, you know, what we see here is that David is, he has two things. He has no fear of man and also no fear of intimacy with God. And it's almost like he's saying, I know this is it. This is the thing that's made me not fear man is that I've gotten to a place where I'm not afraid to be intimate with God. I'm not afraid to be near to God. I'm not afraid to pour out my heart to him, to invite him into my questions, to my pains, to my struggles, to, to everything. And I'm getting exposed to that little by little over the course of our entire lives. Right? No, Alex Honnold didn't go from climbing in a rock gym to getting a documentary in two days. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a journey. This is a lifelong journey for us. And then David kind of ratchets down a little bit. If you go just a few verses down to verse eight. It says this, you have said, seek my face. This is David saying to God, God, you said to me, David, seek my face. And he goes on, my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Some of, some of you, this is, makes you very uncomfortable. I, I think to some degree it makes us all uncomfortable. A face-to-face -face kind of encounter and relationship with God. I mean, I thought he was high and holy and, and, and lifted up and with the, you know, the train of his robe filling, filling the, the temple and being the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. And I'm not supposed to cozy up with him. I'm not supposed to, he's got other things to do. It might not even be biblical. It is biblical. But it's not the only part of the story. That's not the only part of how God wants to relate with you and what he invites you into. He also says, yes, that's who I am. And I also want you to seek my face. I, there's a lot of different ways you can communicate with people. You can call them. And you get a little bit of exposure there, right? You hear their voice, but you can't see them. You could FaceTime or Zoom. Okay, so now you can see and you can hear. Or, you know, even with texting, like, we invented emojis. Because putting a little face in there helps convey a little bit more. There's power in a face. There's power in the unique personality. Like, that's, what's, that's what identifies you as you is your face, that's how someone knows it's you. And God's saying, I want to do that with you. I want you to know me and my unique personality, my characteristics, who I really am. And David's saying, look, this, that's the secret. That's the secret. Because I've gotten in his presence and I've heard his invitation to come and seek his face and, and I'm doing that. And that's reducing my level, my threat level of what other people can do with me because I know God is with me and for me. But then it's kind of an interesting thing to say, seek my face. God's invisible. You and I have faces. You can't see God. What does that even mean, seek his face? And if you think about, you know, maybe some of you have, have heard this or, you know, thought about this. I feel like it comes up somewhat often with just this idea of like, God, you know, 
what, what's the expression on your face right now when you think of me? It's kind of a barometer for what your relationship with God is like. You know, is it like his eyebrows are raised in confusion over what in the world you're doing and saying with your life? Is it his teeth gritting, his you know, fist clenching because he's angry at you because you're being disobedient? Or, or is it his cheeks are red because he's embarrassed of you? It's like, I want to be associated with you. I mean, can we... Can you know God's face? The ability to live in confidence and security, not in fear, fear of other people, but actually live in such a way that you are for other people and you can sacrifice yourself for other people, it it hangs on this. And this is where, when you read the Old Testament, you have to read it in light of the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, there's a short little verse in Colossians 1.15 that tells you so much about who Jesus is. It says this, he, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Listen, God does have a face. And it looks like Jesus. And what we know about Jesus is that He left the comfort of heaven. He gave that up for a time to lay down his life for you, to to exchange places with you. Not because he had to, but because he loved you. And he loved you literally to death. And think about that. If you love someone enough to die for them, would it make you, would you be bothered by them seeking you out? No. What would bother you is that person not seeking you out. What would bother you is that that person was aloof and didn't care and didn't think about you. Whatever the enemy wants to tell you that you're not allowed to approach God, you're not, he doesn't even want your presence in his presence. He whatever that may sound like in your ears, in your heart and minds, the cross tells you otherwise. The cross is the clearest place where you see into the heart of God because it's God made visible doing what None of us would do if we were God. And that, it's when you get exposed to that, not just some big powerful God up in the sky, not just whatever you think him to be, but when you get exposed to that, when the face of Christ, and again, you know, it's like, okay, he was here, but he's not here anymore. If you didn't know that, Jesus isn't on earth anymore. He ascended. But you know what he did do? 40 days after he ascended into heaven, He told his disciples, wait, wait, don't do anything before I send the helper. Jesus himself actually now is available to you, not somewhere out there, but actually right in here by just turning and seeking him. He begins that kind of relationship with you where he's not way out there, but he's actually right here with you. Wherever you go, whatever you're doing, the look on on God's face is the face of like the prodigal father when he sees his son, who was a screw up, squandered all of his inheritance, but he said, look, maybe I'll just turn and seek. And then what's the father do? He comes running, running to his son when he saw him from a long way off and he was just, that's all it took. And the cross tells you that you can do that. So I want to just get a little practical. It's like, okay, this all sounds great. This is all nice. But but what what does this look like? What does this daily encountering Jesus that turns down the volume on my fear of man? Because I see that I'm, I'm actually in the presence. Not only am I not alone, I'm not an orphan. 
I'm an, I'm an adopted and beloved son or daughter of the, the creator and king. And I know because of Jesus and what Romans 8 says that not only is he with me, but he's also for me and he's not against me. And that exposure to that begins to give you courage and boldness. Two things I wanna put in front of you. And the first is gonna sound very like, duh, and churchy, but I just wanna put it out there. I'm like, okay, so what does this look like to, to do this? I think one very simple way is prayer. Jesus very clearly did not fear man. And he also was regularly exposing himself to his father's presence. He was regularly getting away. He was God for crying out loud and he still did that. He knew he needed that and he wanted that. I heard someone recently describe prayer like this and it's been, it's been very helpful for me but just prayer is relaxing into God's presence. It's so easy to think about prayer as like this very stiff thing and it's like, I think we all have that to some degree. But even if you're stiff, there is some part of your spirit that's relaxing. Relaxing with the Lord, relaxing into him, your creator, your savior, your master, your friend, and that can't not change you. Pete Gregg, who is uh, a pastor in the UK and founder and leader of the 24-7 prayer movement, describes it like this, that when you get into God's presence, through prayer in particular, nothing changes. Nothing really changes. You still have to go to work. You still have to put food on the table. You still have to go to class. Nothing changes, and yet everything changes. Think about it like this. I, a couple years ago, my car was dying. I knew I needed to get a new car, and so I decided I wanted to get a Subaru Crosstrek because, you know, I had to get some that fit, fit my vibe of like being outdoorsy, you know, but not too outdoorsy. You know, so Subaru Crosstrek, that's what I was going to get. So I started looking online and figuring out, you know, where would be the best place to get one. And then lo and behold, I'm seeing Subaru Crosstreks everywhere. They're all over the place. It's like just Subaru factory just dumped a bunch of Crosstreks in Birmingham the day after I started looking online. It's like, were they not there before? Of course they were there. But I wasn't noticing them. I wasn't thinking about them. I wasn't primed to notice them. And I think it's the exact same way with, with God. It can be, look, even for me as a pastor, it can be so easy to go Sunday to Sunday, maybe even longer, without thinking about, okay, look, this isn't all just some book. It isn't all just some thing that I'm doing, but actually God is with us. He's actually here right now by his spirit. That this actually, as we take that step, which second thing I think can look like this, is what a 17th century monk named Brother Lawrence describes as practicing the presence of God, which he spent a lot of his life trying to help people understand, like, this is not like some hard, high, mystical thing. This is just, for him, I think it's a bit ambitious, but for him, every 60 seconds, he tried to bring to his mind a simple thought like this, God is here. Your presence, you're with me. Because it can be so easy to go days, weeks, months, years, an entire life feeling like an orphan. And what a tragedy to be adopted, beloved son or daughter, but feel like an orphan. You may be thinking, okay, that's great, he's a monk. Okay? If I lived in a monastery up on a hill in south of France, you know, I, I could think about God every 60 seconds too, but I've got real problems. The funny thing about Brother Lawrence is he actually wasn't like a legit monk. He was like a lay, I don't even know what they call him, he's like a lay monk. He wasn't even like, he just like lived there and he was the cook. 
He was the cook. He had a real job. He wasn't out there like meditating and levitating and, you know, praying all day. He was just, he had a real job. And yet people came from all over the world to ask him, like, you have got, like, you've got it. You've got the kind of relationship with God that I know we can have, and I want that. And so often he would just come back to this. It's just being aware of God's presence. Not some faceless God, but the God who has a face. Jesus. So I don't know where, where you're at with how present you feel like the Lord is with you. But as you... Begin thinking about the fact that maybe he is more than I think he is. You might begin to notice it more too, and that might help. This morning, when I pulled in early this morning, and I parked down at the bottom of this slope over here by the bamboo. If you don't know, there's bamboo over there. It's not a joke. It's actually real bamboo. I don't know how it got there, but it's there. Um, I pulled in, and there was only one car down there parked right there. And I had to laugh to myself because when I pulled in, it was a black Subaru Crosstrek. <laughs> I, ha- I drive and I'm driving in that moment a black Subaru Crosstrek. And I had to just laugh because I was, it was like God was just dropping a little hint like, look, buddy, you're, you're about to go talk to all these people about my presence and guess what? I'm with you. I'm here. So, you know, as we go into this week, you know, just, I want you to be open to taking a step closer to Jesus. Whether that's your first step ever, but you're like, I know, I know that I need this. Or maybe it's, you're, you've, you're way down the line, but just another step. It says, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. So it may not look like every 60 seconds. Maybe you just try, look, I'm just gonna try every day at lunch this week to just not be the weird guy in the office, but just just take a second, just remind myself, God, you're here. God is present. You are with me and for me and not against me. And I think over a lifetime, that could get us to a place where we might just be able to scale El Capitan, something unthinkable, like get into a place where we we. We, have, we lack so much fear. We have so much confidence in the Lord. Not because we have our head in the sand, but because we don't. Because we see who he is, his love, his kindness, his mercy, his goodness, and his power that he not only died on the cross, but he actually rose from the grave. That it could quite literally change your life. And so in just a moment, as we have a song of response. We're gonna have a few people here at the front that would just love to pray with you. If there's just, if you're wanting to take that first step towards Jesus and you just want someone to pray for you, we'd love to do that. If, if you're just saying, look, God's been really, I wasn't expecting to hear from him this morning, but he's really been working on something in my heart, I would love someone to just pray more of what God is doing into my life. Dealing with fear, fear of man, we just would love to, have this moment with you and with Jesus. So let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for doing so much for us and yet also putting up with us when we just go about our lives like you're not even there. So Lord, have mercy on us. It's just myself included, Lord, we want to walk with you. We wanna talk with you like Adam and Eve did in the garden before everything went south and like we will do one day when we see you face to face and when, as Revelation says, that you dwell with your people. Lord, we know that we can have that now and not only can we, Lord, we need that. We, every single one of us desperately needs that, Jesus. So, Lord, would you just give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, even just this week, taking a step into not fearing intimacy with you, knowing you have a smile on your face because you literally died for us and that you just want us to to come home to you. 
So Jesus, we love you and we pray it in your name. Amen.